Shall we pray together? Through your word, Lord, we can begin to make sense of our life. As we experience the highs and lows of life, the joy and elation of pleasure, the pain of sadness and suffering, we learn to trust you. For you only know the full tapestry of each life, and only through your word will we find the way to weave that tapestry into a thing of beauty. Speak to us once again today as we hear your word, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. The first reading is taken from Psalm 16, 16, verses 5 to 11. Is that right? 16? Yeah. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realms of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You know me, you make known to me the the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Thus far. The second reading is from the Gospel according to St. Luke, and it's chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. It's found on page 79 of the Pew Bible. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came up on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? he asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the waters, and they obey him. The final reading is from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, Revelation 21, and reading the first five verses. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. May God add his blessing to his word this morning. Advent season is the time where we stop and we remember Jesus. So hundreds of years have passed between the last word in the Old Testament and the birth of Jesus. There's been centuries of silence, centuries of absolutely Nothing. There was no prophet. There was no act of God for over 400 years. When the Old Testament ended, there was simply silence for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And at the end of the silence, imagine all these hundreds of years, at the end of the silence, angels all of a sudden, out of nowhere, appear to shepherds in the fields nearby, and they said, this is the night. This is the night when the silence will end, 
This is the night when the Word will become flesh, when the Son of God will be born, Jesus. And they say, glory to God in the highest, after hundreds of years of silence. Today in Bethlehem, a child has been born, and he is Christ the Lord, after hundreds and hundreds of years of nothing. What that says to you and to me today is that as we wait, there's always hope. While we are waiting, God is working. While we are waiting, God is active. God is alive. God is working. And there may be seasons in our lives, and there often are, when we think, when we don't think anything is happening, and God is simply silent. And then there's that moment when God shows up and we say glory to God in the highest. They thought for hundreds of years nothing was happening. So that's what they thought. But God was slowly moving history so that the Son of God could enter humanity and become the Savior of the world. God was orchestrating this event and it took him hundreds of years. Because God always works for the best. He always works for the good and he always works for his glory. So be reminded today that God is working. That God is doing something in your life and he will keep on doing something in your life even if you think he's silent. Even if you feel like nothing is happening, he will keep working in your life until you see him face to face. Jesus came to Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. But he's coming again That's the promise in the book of Revelation. And when he comes again, he will come to put everything right. He will come to end all this foolishness that is going on in this world. Jesus said, I'm coming again. When I come again, I'm going to set it all right. He came that one night in Bethlehem to a little insignificant place as a little baby. And when he comes again, he says, it's going to be the greatest day in the history of all humankind. For every one of us that has put our hope and put our trust and faith in him. And the Bible says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, just like that, he's going to put it all right. Just like that. That's what we believe in faith as Christians. That's what we are longing for. That's what we are hoping for. That's what we are holding on to. That's your story and that's my story as we wait. God is working. He's working. He's orchestrating it, his second coming. And he will come through. And he will put this broken world right again. Each person seated here this morning is waiting on something. And I know some of your stories, a lot of them. I know what some of you are waiting for. But you're all waiting for something. Some of you are waiting on a deal to come through. Some of you are are waiting on somebody in your business to give you an answer. Some of you are waiting for a result of some sort. Some of you are waiting for a, a problem to be resolved. Some of you are waiting on a relationship in your family to be restored. Some of you are waiting desperately to go and leave. Oh, Kim big nod. Some of you are waiting for your 13th check. Some of you are just waiting for something to happen in your life. Something good, something new. You're waiting. You're all waiting. You're saying, God, I need you to come through for me. I need you to do something here. But none of us are, are waiting for anything bigger than the second coming and the return of Christ. That's what we're actually all waiting for. So while we are are waiting for all of the above things and hundreds of more that I haven't mentioned, what we're really waiting for is Jesus to come. And that's what Advent is about. It's about waiting. We've heard, we know the story. He came as a, a Messiah, but we're waiting for him to come as the reigning Lord and King, and we are waiting. This is how the scripture ends in Revelation 21. You know how it's going to end. You can read it. He's given it to you in his word. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. That's how it's going to end. 
We know. You thought you were just getting a new heaven, but you're getting a new earth as well. Revelation tells us that it's not just Christ in a body that lived for 33 years, not just the Holy Spirit that lives in us now while we journey in the season of waiting, but God himself will come back and be his presence amongst us, and we will live with him forever. The new city will come down, says Revelation. It will come down out of heaven, and we are waiting for that. And this is what he says I'm going to do when that happens. I'm going to wipe every tear from your eyes. There's no more death and no more mourning and no more crying and no more pain. Oh man, I wish he'd come now. (laughs) Don't you think? You wouldn't have to get up to go to work tomorrow morning. And he says something even more profound. He says, I am going to make everything new. That's the way our story is going to end. We know how it's going to end if we love Jesus. And when he comes, I'm sure he's going to say, yes, I know the waiting's been hard. I know you've had pain. I know you've suffered. I know this planet is broken and this world is in pain. But he says, I'm going to wipe all those tears and there's going to be no more suffering, no more crying, no more pain because I'm going to make it all new. New heaven, new earth. I mean, just think about what's gone on in this world in the last 12 months this year and all the terrorist, particularly the terrorist att- att- attacks. And in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and it could happen in the next five minutes, God says, I'm going to make it all new. That's what we're waiting for. That's part of the hope when we light the candle of hope. It could happen today. It could happen tonight. It could happen next year. But it's going to happen. And so we wait. We wait. And in this moment of of waiting, whatever you are waiting for in your life, and as we wait for this sad world and broken world to be set right, what do we do while we wait? We fix our eyes on Jesus. Well, that's what we're meant to do. But so often we fix our eyes on the problems and we fix our eyes on on the challenges and we fix our eyes on the fact that the dollar and the pound has gone haywire again. And we fix our eyes on that. And not on Jesus, who's going to come through, who's going to set it all right, who's going to make it new again. That's our hope. Fix our eyes on him. Not on the circumstances, not on the bad news, not on the things that are worrying us. We fix our eyes on Jesus because that's where hope is born. That's where life comes from. Psalm 16 tells you where you're going to put your hope. Go and read it again this evening. The psalmist confesses and he says in verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. I put the Lord where? Before me. I fix my eyes on him. So in the storms of life, in the difficulties of life, so often those circumstances Whatever they are at work or at home or we see in the world, they, they, they obstruct our view. We put them before us. And what we have to do is put Jesus back in front and fix our eyes on him. He is, the psalmist says, he's the one I've set always before me. Whatever you're waiting for, whatever you're waiting for, that so often is the dominant thing in your life. It's the dominant thought in your life comes the thing you you kind of view the world through. It's your central view. So yes, maybe it's it's a diagnosis or maybe it's cancer or maybe it's some sort of a health condition or whatever it is. Whatever it is, just remember that there's always Jesus and it's Jesus we've got to put, put back into our front view. It's Jesus we've got to fix our eyes on and not the problems. So you may have an obstacle. You may have a mountain or whatever you you want to call it. We're not denying that today. But you have a God. You have a God. You have a God. And Hebrews says, so throw off everything that hinders and run with perseverance and fix your eyes on Jesus. As we walk, as we run, says Hebrews, fix our eyes on Jesus. That's the choice. 
That's the choice the, the psalmist says that, that he has. And he says, this is the choice I made. He said, I chose to put the Lord, set the Lord continually before me. Not my circumstances, not my problems, not the dollar, not the pound. I'm not going to deny those challenges in my life. I'm not going to deny the difficulties at work or the difficulties in my family. I'm not going to deny them. I'm not going to act as if there's no challenges in my life. But I'm not going to allow them to become my fixation because I'm going to put Jesus in front of them. I'm going to remember that he came and he's going to come again and he's going to set it all right and make it all new. He came through hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago for those ancient people. And he's, he's going to come again and he's going to come through for us and he's going to set it all right. But our eyes have got to be on him. We read the story about the calming of the storm. Jesus goes into the storm with his people so that he can show very simply that he's greater than the storm, that he's greater than the challenges before them. The passage doesn't say when storms come, he, you speak a word and everything just goes away and it's all solved overnight. It's not what it says. The message is, is bigger than that. The message says that life is full of storms. Life is hard. Life is difficult. No kidding ourselves about that. Life is full of storms. But our storms are full of Jesus. They're full of Jesus. So when the storm came up and they were in their boat, where was Jesus? In the storm with them. I've set the Lord continually before me. Said the psalmist. So whatever storm you find yourself in this Advent, some of you are in storms, whatever storm you find yourself in in this Advent, your storm is full of Jesus. It's full of Jesus. You go to him in the storm. And you say, Master, Jesus, I feel like I'm going to drown. I feel like I'm sinking. Just my eyeballs are barely sticking out of this one. And he says, no, you're not going to drown. You're not going to drown. You set me continually before you. You're not going to drown. Fix your eyes on me. It's not because he stops the rain. It's not because he stops the waves. It's not because he stops the storm. Because it's because I'm Jesus. And I'm in the storm. And you're not going to go under. I'm here. So can he heal and can he cure you of your illness or whatever's wrong with you or solve your problems right here and right now? Of course he can. Of course he can. But he may not. But here's the the kind of keys that even in all those difficulties, you're not going to go under, you're not going to drown because he's with you. And the psalmist says, and I'm saying it again, I've set the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. And maybe that's the verse you need to take into 2016 with you from Psalm 16. As you go into 2016, say, I'm going to set the Lord always before me. Jesus says, I've come. We know that story. But I'm coming again. And while you're waiting in the season of Advent and thereafter, as you go into the new year, Put me before you. Set the Lord continually before you. Put that face of Jesus here. Get that face of Jesus in front of the challenges that you have. Because they may not be left behind in 2015. You'll take them with you into 2016. But put the face of Jesus before you. Put his love and his grace and his hope and his peace and his joy in front of you. Put your, make your fixation on Jesus. I'm going to conclude. What happens when we do that? What happens when we do that as we wait? Our hearts beat. Our hearts beat. There's a warmth in them because our hearts were made for Jesus. If you let the obstacle, if you let the challenge get between you and Jesus, what's going to happen? Your heart just shrivels up and you die on the inside. Because your heart was, was made for Jesus and was, you were made by Jesus and you were made for Jesus. Your heart's for Jesus. If you don't have Jesus in your life, you don't have what you were made for. 
So don't let obstacles, don't let challenges, don't let your circumstances at work, don't let your financial situation, don't let cir- challenging circumstances in your family, don't let any obstacles steal your heart. I've wondered this year particularly because it's been a tough year. And I've wondered over and over again how people get through storms without Jesus. Those that don't know Jesus. Have you ever wondered that? How do they do that? How do they cope in the face of of death and trials and tribulation? How do they do that? You can only come to the conclusion that God gets them through. He gets them through. Because there's nobody in this world, whether you believe in Jesus or not, that could, you, that could get through the trials and tribulations of life without him. And so God is gracious. And he just extends his grace. Because we wouldn't get through it without him. He's just, that's all I, it's the only conclusion I can come to that. He's just grace, gracious. He says, I'll get you through. I'll get you through. We have more than just the grace of God as Christians, if we call ourselves Christians. We have a relationship. We have a a relationship with Jesus. That's what our hearts were made for. That's why they beat. That's what makes them beat. Secondly, with Jesus before us, our hearts beat. We get hope. We have hope. We have hope. He was raised from the dead on the third day. That is hope. That is hope. The gift of eternal life. That is hope. Hundreds and hundreds of years of silence and all of a sudden a little helpless baby in a dirty stable, born to teenage parents. That is hope. That is hope. And if you think of your life now as you come to the end of 2015 and embark on a new year and stand on the verge of a new one going into 2016, and some of you are thinking, how on earth am I going to work this one out? How on earth am I going to get this one right? How is it all going to work out for me? Jesus says, I'm coming again. I'm coming again. And I'm going to make it all new. That's hope. That's the miracle. Everything that's been made wrong, he says, I am going to make it right. So even though your currency plummets and we go, oh my goodness, what are we going to do about it? Big drama, catastrophe, let's blame everybody. He says, I, not you, I am going to make it right. So stop worrying about it. Everything that is going is wrong, he will make right. He's coming again. We've suffered death in our lives. We've suffered all the pain of sin and the consequences of that. But he says, don't worry, I'm going to make it all right and there'll be no more of that. That's hope. So please, control freaks amongst you. Let me just look at some of you. Please don't spend Advent trying to get it and make it all right. Don't spend Advent trying to make it all right. That's not your job. Don't try and control it. Let it go. Jesus says, I'll make it new. I will make it new. That's his job. Don't spend Advent trying to get justice from somebody else because they did me wrong. They were mean to me. They took my money. They've hurt me. I'll get them back. No Christmas presents for them. Off the list, you know. We can be mean. Let it go. Don't try and make it right. That's his job. Let it go. It's not going to make it any easier if you try and make it right. Let it go. He is going to make it right. He's going to make it all new. Trust him. There's always hope. And lastly, when we put Jesus before us, when we set the Lord continually before us, what do we do? We want to worship him. Because that's perspective. And if we realize, but I was made for worship. My heart was made for Jesus. 
was made to worship him. So it doesn't matter what the obstacle is or what the mountain is before me. When I put Jesus before me, what's the thing I have to do other than love him is worship him. That's what we were made for. Not for this other stuff that we get distracted by and sidetracked by. We were actually made to worship Jesus. It's just a by the way that you have to go to work every day and do all this other stuff. It's not what you were made for. You were made to worship Jesus. And the devil hates that. He hates that. He hates it particularly when we worship God in the difficult places, in those valleys that we talk about. But it's in those places that we need to be reminded of God's faithfulness and God's hope and the trust that we have in Him. It's in those moments in the valley where we say, God, even here I'm going to set you continually before me. I'm not going to be shaken because you are with me, says the psalmist. Because you're amazing, God. There's no other like you. So even though you may be sitting in this Advent season and you think, how on earth are all these pieces going to be put together? How on earth is my life going to unravel and unfold going forward? Because right now it's frenetic and fragmented and it's chaos because it's a busy time of the year. Put him before you and worship him. Put Jesus before you. That's why we sang that song, that the last song. Some of you may not have known it, but it said, and we deliberately sang it this morning. Why? Because the word said, the, these are the words, I know who goes before me. I know who goes before me. I know who is standing behind me. The God of angel armies is always by my side. That's why we sang it. Because Jesus is in my view. He's the one I continually set before me. The God of angel armies is with me. That's who's going with me into 2016. So there will be problems and there will be difficulties. But you have a God. You have a God. And first and foremost, it's not to worry about the things that are distracting you. It's to worship Him. The psalmist says, I've set the Lord. I'm driving this home to you today. I've set the Lord always before me. Because He is at my right hand and I will not be shaken. I know you too well. I know what you do. (laughs) Don't do the same. I set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. In the next verse, the psalmist says, when we are, when we are centered on him, we, sorry, I'm just paraphrasing, we can't stop our hearts from praising. He says, therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. When I do that, when I set the Lord continuously before me, what happens? I don't become miserable and depressed and distracted by the things of the world. He says, my heart rejoices. My tongue rejoices. Sorry, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. That's what happens when I put God before me. You know what happens when you don't. To the doctor we go, a few more little pink pills, you know. Can't cope. (laughs) But if I set him before me, my heart is glad. My tongue rejoices. So we wait. We are waiting in Advent. We're waiting for Jesus to come. We're waiting for him to restore, to redeem, to sort out this messed up world. We're waiting for him to come and make it all new. And while we wait, what are we going to do? Come on. And put him? Thank you. Your tithes and offerings will be received.